my handout in the email this week. Bruce, I tried. Can I interrupt? Sir. Were you mentioning that there was a unbeliever? Yes. Bruce, that were in the group that were executed, beheaded? Yeah. Uh-huh. Did you recognize the reality of it? Yes. Wow. And he accepted the Lord Yeshua just before he was put to death. Wow. That's the testimony we need to be giving, folks, of the united people in him so that others can see him in us. It's awesome. I couldn't believe that when I read the story. I had to confirm it in other ways, and that was true. That was one. Pardon? Can you send it to me, please? If I still have it. <laughs> if I still have it. I don't send everybody everything. You may think I send you a lot of emails, but I don't send everything. If you want everything, I'll send it. Just let me know. Today we're going to be talking about the Transfiguration. And by the way, this course of study actually comes from a course of study that I uh, taught at the Yeshiva and also at Biblical Life College and Seminary. Now, the detail or the depth of this class, as opposed to my previous teaching, and Larry Morrell can guarantee he sat in on my guinea, as a guinea pig in my first class. Larry Morales uh, noted that there's not that depth that we're giving today. And the reason why is I only have one semester that I could teach in, so I had to gear everything, the recordings, the overheads, everything together within a time frame that could be accomplished with one semester. You're getting more than that. So we're going to talk about the transfiguration. If you did buy the textbook, The Gospel of Matthew, a social rhetorical commentary by Keener. You'll read more about it, if you will, on pages 436 to 443. Now go with me to Matthew chapter 17. And what we see in Matthew chapter 17 is what is described as the transfiguration that was witnessed by Yeshua's three disciples. And as Wikipedia would report on the transfiguration of Jesus, it's an event that's reported by the Synoptic Gospels. That's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. They're known as the Synoptic Gospels. In other words, they're so closely related, they tie together so well. Whereas the Gospel of John is not. Not that John is not accurate. John says some things that the other Gospels do not. But these three are in sync with one another. And in all three of these Gospels, Matthew 17, 1 through 9, Mark 9 through 2, 8, 2 through 8, and Luke 9, 28 to 36, all three of them speak about the transfiguration of Yeshua on the mountain. Here Yeshua becomes radiant, so bright, that he even outshines the sun. And then we see two figures from Israel's past coming and speaking with our Lord Yeshua, both Moshe and Eliyahu. We also see that he's called by a bot coal, and I'll explain what a bot coal is in a moment. He's also called the son by a voice from heaven. Now this transfiguration does something, and it puts Yeshua above Moses and Elijah. They're coming to him, they're speaking to him, and these two are preeminent figures in Judaism. So you can get that if you went on the internet, go to wikipedia.org and go to the transfiguration of Jesus. Now what we see here in Matthew 17, 1 through 9, since this course is the Gospel of Matthew from a Jewish perspective. We're not looking at any other Gospels here. We're looking at the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 through 9. So if you wanted to follow with me in the complete Jewish Bible, here we go. Six days later, Yeshua took Kepha, that is Peter, Yaakov, James, and his brother Yochanan, that's John, and led them up a high mountain privately. And as they watched, he began to change form. His face shone like the sun, and his clothing became as white as light. And then they looked and saw Moses, Moshe, and Eliyahu speaking with him. Kepha said to Yeshua, it's good that we're here, Lord. I'll put up three shelters if you want, one for you, one for Moshe, and one for Eliyahu. Now while he was still speaking, it says, a bright cloud enveloped them, and a voice from the cloud said, this is my son who I love, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. When the Talmudim, that's the disciples, heard this, they were so frightened that they fell face down on the ground. 
But Yeshua came and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. So they opened their eyes, looked up, and saw only Yeshua by himself. As they came down the mountain, Yeshua ordered them, Don't tell anyone what you've seen until the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Now, of course, in the parallel passages of Mark and Luke, you're going to find the same story. So what you see here is the transfiguration is where Yeshua's changing form. He's becoming as bright as the sun. You're going to see in all three of the Gospels, you're going to see a voice, or a bat kol, as it's known in Hebrew, coming from out of the cloud, saying, this is my beloved son, listen to him. All three of the Gospel accounts in the Synoptic Gospels do that. Some of them, of course, give us a little bit more information than the others, and I'll touch on that in a little bit. Sir? Can you define bat kol? I will be. Okay. Yeah. I'm not going to do it yet. He said to her, do you think? Patience, patience. <laughs> About cool, I will be doing it. So, as I was studying this, I had some questions. Every time we study any passage in the Bible, we should go a little bit deeper, generally, than just reading it at face value. Now, we've talked about this in the past when we were talking about rabbinical interpretation of Scripture. And we talked about PARDIS. PARDIS. That's an acronym. The P sound of PARDIS is HASHAP, which means the plain and simple. What the text says is what it means. The next one is RAMIS, the R sound of PARDIS. And that means it's a hinting. The D sound, the D, that's the DARASH, that's digging deeper into the passage. And finally, the sod. The sod is where you go into the mystical type meaning. Now an important rule in this is none of the deeper levels violate the Peshat. You have to always understand, if somebody is giving you a darash or a deeper spiritual meaning, i.e. the sod, it must not violate the textual meaning of the Peshat. If it does, they are leading you off the path and red flags should be waving in your head. You need to always stay with the Peshat. Now the question is, it says six days later from where they were in Caesarea Philippi, meaning that they could still be in that same area. Remember, they walked back then. We drive, mostly. Six days, and it's sub-mountain. And if you've been to Israel, you know there are a few of them some good-sized hills. The thing about these accounts, none of them identify what that mountain is. Some say it was Mount Tabor, that's Mount Tabor right there, and that's located in the lower Galilee. That's not too far away, relatively speaking, from Caesarea Philippi. The summit is 575 meters or 1,843 feet above sea level, so it's pretty good size. There's some history associated with that. If it is Mount Tabor, then there was a battle between Barak, not our Barak, and the army of Yabin, commanded by Sisera. So you've got that. There's another possibility, Mount Erman. Mount Erman is closest to the Caesarea, uh, Caesarea Philippi area. In fact, in fact, it's Mount Erman that you're gonna get a lot of the water that comes down from the mountain and goes into the Jordan River. That's a little bit higher. It's 2,814 meters or 9,230 feet above sea level. For a man such as myself, so out of shape, it would probably take me six days to get to the top from wherever I come from. The next question is why Moshe and Eliyahu? What did these two represent? Now, somehow or other, I got that messed up. Eliyahu is easy <laughs> right now represents the prophets. Who does Moshe represent? The Torah. The Tanakh, the Hebrew scriptures, are divided up into three parts. The first five books are that of the Torah. It ends at Devarim chapter 34, and then the prophets begin with Joshua and go all the way through until you get to the Psalms, the Tehillim. And then you get in the Tehillim, or the Psalms, then you get um, all the way to the end, which ends in Chronicles. So you've got what is known as the Tanakh, the first five books, or the Torah, 
the next remaining books in the middle are the Nevi'im, that's the prophets, and finally, up until we get to the Brit Hadashah in our Bibles, the Ketuvim, the Ketuvim are the writings. So that's how the Hebrew scriptures are divided. Moses represents the Torah, the five books of Moses, of Yahweh, the prophets. Next question I have, why the transfiguration? What is God trying to show us, or them by extension, or show his disciples? What was the point of going through all this? Well, I found a couple of things. Number one, it reinforced what Peter had said back in Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi. And that is that our Lord Yeshua is the Messiah, the Son of the living God. To refresh your mind, Matthew 16, from our last teaching. When our Lord Yeshua asked, who do the people say the Son of Man is? Well, Yochanan the Immerser, Eliyahu, Yeremahu, or one of the other prophets. And then Shimon Kepha, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. The revelation of this to Peter was not by mankind or his own reasoning, but rather that it came from him. So we find, find in this we find in this transfiguration the identification of Yeshua being the son of the living God and the Messiah. Now, as I mentioned just a couple minutes ago, some of these gospel accounts in the synoptic gospels give us a little bit more information than the other ones do. So I always ask, what do you think Moses, Elijah, and uh, uh, Yeshua were all talking about? Well, Luke fills us in. In Luke 9.31, they appeared in glorious splendor and spoke of his exodus. In other words, not the exodus leading uh, Egypt, per se, but yes, there was that, you know, talking together. We all left for Egypt, did we not? But his exodus here, in this case, from his life as the Passover lamb, which he was going to accomplish soon in Jerusalem. Do you think our Lord Yeshua needed to be bolstered and encouraged a little bit to say, okay, I've got to go ahead and do this? Well, it doesn't tell us, but perhaps. You know, when our Lord Yeshua was praying on his final night at Gethsemane, what did he do? He said, Father, if it be possible, remove this cup from me. So when you know that you're going to go through a suffering and uh, death like crucifixion is, it's something that you really have to think about. Brothers and sisters, there are brothers and sisters being executed in such a way right now in the Middle East. It's happening. We need to be praying for them to be strong. It happened to our Lord Yeshua, and I guess, if you will, if there's a way to die, even Peter said it was unworthy of him to be crucified in the same manner as his Lord. So he was, according to church tradition, crucified upside down. It's a, a possibility in these last days that we may very well be crucified. Too. But it should be an honor to be crucified as our Messiah. Is he going to give us the strength to go through that? Oh, yes, he will. Yes, he will. Now, here's a question for me. Peter, just spontaneously, and one of the things I love about Peter is he's spontaneous, and he comes out with things like, where did that come from? Why is it, now I'm watching uh, this story unfold on the transfiguration, and I see Moses and Elijah and our Lord Yeshua talking together, and all of a sudden Peter comes out with this phrase. He's saying, should I build tabernacles, literally, for you, for Moses and Elijah? What does that have to do with anything? Well, in Peter's mind, it has everything to do. This is why we need to look at this from the Hebrew perspective. Something is going on in Peter's mind, even though he had already heard in Matthew 16, he heard our Lord speaking about going to his own death. At the end of this chapter, you're going to see a reinforcement on this, where Yeshua says, don't tell anybody about this until when? after I resurrect from the dead. But here again is reinforcement 
why did Peter want to build shelters? And by the way, I need to say that if you went to compare the Greek word here with the word Sukkot in Leviticus chapter 23, it's the same word. May I also say, if you go to the Gospel of John, a little bit off the path, a little bit, but not too far. If you go to John 1.14, it says, The Word became a human being and, in Stern's translation, lived with us. That word is best translated. It's Strong's 46.37. It's best translated as tabernacled. Not simply lived. Tabernacled. What was Peter wanting to build? A tabernacle unto the Lord. So he sees these three. His Lord Yeshua speaking. He sees Moses speaking, the Torah. And he speaks, sees Elijah speaking. And he immediately comes up with this idea, well, you know, you guys need a tabernacle to take care of you while you're here. Um, Here's what the meaning is. If you go back with me to Ezekiel, excuse me, Zechariah chapter 14. I don't know why I have Ezekiel on my mind. Zechariah chapter 14. Now, just to give you a little, while you're looking, just to let you know what's going on. In Zechariah chapter 12, it says, A prophecy, the word of Adonai concerning Israel. Here's the message from Adonai, who stretched out the heavens, laid the foundation of the earth, and formed the spirit inside human beings. I will make Jerusalem a cup that will stagger the surrounding people. Even Judah will be caught up in that siege against Jerusalem. And when that day comes, I will make Jerusalem a heavy stone for all people. All who try to lift it will hurt themselves, and all the earth's nations will be massed against her. Now I want to just stop here for a moment. What is the sticky wicket between the Palestinians and Israel? There's a certain city. Jerusalem. Netanyahu, not so many years ago, said Jerusalem will never be divided. It will always and forever be the capital of Israel. On the other hand, the Palestinians say, we want a peace of Jerusalem, or there will be no peace. Here's your sticky wicket. And we have a president now in office who's on the side of the Palestinians, folks. He is not on the side of Israel. And if you look at this, with the context of the eyes of what Daddy Bush did, remember when they came against Saddam Hussein? He put together a coalition of nations to come against Iraq, did he not? And following it through to even this present day against ISIS and previous to that, Is it possible that the United Nations, including the United States of America, could be amongst those nations, heaven forbid, but could be amongst those nations that we're talking about in Zechariah chapter 12? Because of Jerusalem and because of the recent thing where our president says to Netanyahu, you have to be willing to give up a piece of Jerusalem. That's not all the Palestinians want, folks. What's going to happen then after that? Is it says in verse number 8 of Zechariah 12, when that day comes, Adonai will defend those living in Jerusalem. And dropping down then, verse 9, when that day comes, I will seek to destroy all nations attacking Jerusalem. And I will pour out on the house of David and on those living in Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer. They will look to me whom they pierced. They will mourn for him as one mourns for an only son. Now notice the place that this battle is going to take place. Verse 11. When that day comes, there will be great mourning in Jerusalem. Mourning like that for Hadad Rimen in the what? Megiddo Valley. You know what that is? The battle of Armageddon, folks. Now, world things are converging together to bring this all about in our generation. Wait a minute. We've had three of the four blood moons in our generation. Wait a minute. 
For some of us who are old enough, we were alive when Israel became a nation in 1948. Wow, in our generation, and our Lord says, this generation will now pass till the Son of Man comes. Why do you think all this stuff is happening now? Because this is the generation. I look at it with excitement. Now, my kids don't. They feel like, wait a minute, you're an old man. You've been able to live a life. You've been able to have children. You've been able to grow them up. You've been able to give away your daughter in marriage. You've been able to do all these things, but we're just getting started. Well, it had to happen in somebody's generation, folks. It's in our generation. It's happening now. One more blood moon on Sukkot. Tabernacles. How significant. Both on Passover and on Tabernacles. So what we see in Zechariah chapter 14 is after the battle's all over with, and it says, of all the nations, first number 16, everyone remaining from all the nations that came to attack Jerusalem will go up every year to worship the king, Adonai Tzebaot, that's the Lord of hosts, and to keep the festival of Sukkot, tabernacles. Now, the nations may have gotten this wrong for the last couple thousand years. But, if John 1.14 is right, then he became, our Lord Yeshua, became flesh and sukkah with us. Which is tabernacles. Which is when he was born. He was not born on Christmas Day. He was born on tabernacles. So, once the Lord comes back, all these nations that came against Jerusalem every year will have to go up or they don't get any rain. Well, guess what? You may have had it wrong for 2,000 years, the birthday of Yeshua, but for that last 1,000 years, they're going to be celebrating right on the dot. It's tabernacles. So why is it that Peter wanted to bring, build three shelters? Ah, because he's thinking in his mind, Zechariah chapter 14, He's saying, oh, wow, you're about to reign and rule. So we are going to build sukkahs. Wasn't the right time of the year, but hey, we're going to do it anyway. I, I've heard it taught that, that if you figure it all out, that it did happen, is that this would never happen during the tabernacle. You mean the day of the, transfiggeration? The oh, okay. So well, to check out. I haven't I, figured it out, but it sounds good. Well, I think there's a way to do it. <laughs> Give us a reference and we'll pass it out. Because it'll say this many days and that yeah. and that so, yeah, you Send me a reference. Okay. And I'll send it out. Okay. It would seem to me that, be that makes perfect sense. That's I but I have not computed it out. I, I confess to you, I hate mathematics <laughs> as much as I hate technology. But I have to deal with it. <laughs> If it does, it makes total sense because he's thinking, oh, this is the time of the messianic reign. <laughs> Leviticus 23, I made my point. If you go to the um, Septuagint translation, you go to Leviticus 23, verse 34, go to the Septuagint translation, that word Sukkot in Hebrew is actually going to be the same word that's being used in uh, Matthew chapter 17 and elsewhere. Okay. So what Peter was thinking, to get back to my train of thought, which was leaving, uh, he was thinking that the Lord's thousand-year reign was about to come in. There was a simple problem. He had to die first. He had to resurrect next, like we were talking about at Passover. To answer your question, yeah. what is a bat kol? Now, you've heard of bar mitzvah. What does bar mitzvah mean? Son of the commandment. Bar is Aramaic, actually, not Hebrew. What is a bat mitzvah? A daughter of the commandment. So a, man, a young man coming up to do his bar mitzvah becomes a man in the eyes of the community. A young lady, which is a more recent tradition, if she does her bat mitzvah, she's the daughter of the commandment. 
Now, what is a bat kol? Well, a bat kol in Hebrew is known as the daughter of the voice, literally. If you translate it, bat is daughter, kol is voice. And what it is, is a voice comes from heaven speaking. Now, both in Judaism and Christianity, the voice of God is a heavenly or divine voice which proclaims God's will or judgment. Oftentimes, it's identified with the Holy Spirit, even with God, but it differs essentially from the prophets, even though these spoke through the medium of the Holy Spirit. So, Abat Kol simply is God's revelation as an example when we were at the mountain of Sinai and God was revealing his Torah to us in Devarim 4.12, the scripture says, you heard the voice, the call of the Devarim, the words, but saw no similitude. In other words, he didn't see a form, he only heard a call or a voice. So in this account, we see God revealing himself to man through his organs of hearing and not through those of sight. So. You see in the prophet Ezekiel, for instance, he sees many visions, but he hears the voice of one who spoke in Ezekiel 128. That would be a voice of God. Similarly, Eliyahu recognizes God with a still small voice. You know, he's hiding in the cave from Jezebel, and God sends an earthquake, and God's voice was not in the quake. God sends a huge fire. His voice was not in the fire. So, how did God speak to Eliyahu? Through a still, small voice. That's the bot call. <laughs> he heard God's voice. Would the burning bush be the bot call? What? The burning bush incident? No. Would that be yeah, that would be a bot call. Yep. Through an auditory experience. So, in the Breed Hadashah, you'll see the mention of a voice from heaven speaking. For instance, in Matthew 17, where it says in verse 5, A voice from the cloud said, This is my son, who I love with whom I'm well pleased, listen to him. Also in the synoptics, the same um, passage basically, that a voice, or excuse me, then a cloud enveloped them, and a voice came out of the cloud, this is my son, who I love, listen to him. Same thing in Luke 9, a voice comes out of the cloud saying, this is my son, who I've chosen, listen to him. So previously we heard about coal, probably some people did, and that was at the baptism or the mikvah of Yeshua in Matthew 3, Verse 17, when the Holy Spirit came down, a voice came from heaven. Now that's being separate and apart from the Spirit. The Spirit was coming down in a form, and the bot coal came from heaven, saying the same thing he did in Matthew 17, this is my son who I love. We saw that in Mark 1, we see that in Luke 3, verse 22. We also see different uh, experiences with the voice by different people. For instance, Rabbi Shaul. He heard that on the road to Damascus about Batko. So you're going to see the Batko, a voice from heaven, coming numerous times. And what this Batko on the mountain does is a couple things. One, it reinforces what God already said about Yeshua. It reinforces what Peter said, coming from heaven, back in Matthew 16, about Yeshua being the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Now, Islam says today, what? God cannot have a son. <coughs> Which are you going to believe? You see, this one man believed by seeing these other men about to die. He isn't even a believer. He suddenly sees, oh, these guys have something I don't have. I'm sure he could have converted to Islam on the spot, and they may or may not have let him go. But he didn't value his life that way. He was willing to die with the other men for this Lord Yeshua, who is the Son of God. Islam says God cannot have a son. Judaism says the same thing. God cannot have a son, but not a literal son, as we see it in the scripture. So here on the Mount of Transfiguration, the Bat Kol reinforces that Yeshua is the Son of the living God. Then the Bat Kol tells the disciples there to listen to Yeshua, his son. So after that, Yeshua's left alone, and they look at Yeshua, and they kept quiet, and they told no one what they had seen. Now, probably this is one of the shortest messages I probably has it, shortest messages I've ever given. We're going to end here at Matthew chapter 17. What we're going to see in Matthew chapter 17, we're getting ready to move 
closer and closer to Jerusalem. And in Matthew chapter 17, we see here that Yeshua is telling them, don't tell anyone until after the Son of Man has been raised from the dead. Verse number 9. Verse 10, the Talmudim asked him, why do the Torah teachers say that Eliyahu must come first? Well, in the one sense, Eliyahu just came on the mountain, and Moses did too. And there you have representatives of the Torah, you have representatives there of the prophets. But our Lord had already mentioned that Elijah, as it says in verse 11, is coming and will restore all things. On the other hand, I tell you that Eliyahu has come already, and the people did not recognize him, but they did to him what they pleased. And in the same way, the Son of Man too is about to suffer at their hands. That is speaking about John, the baptizer. And then the disciple understood that he was talking to them about Yochanan the Immersive. What we're seeing here in this, and I know that there are more things that we see in the Gospel of Matthew. And that is, here we need to understand there was a messianic significance that Peter caught with this transfiguration with Moses and Elijah and Yeshua on the mountain. And that is what Peter caught in the context of the future messianic reign. Folks, however tough things will get, and they will get tougher, we need to realize, just like our father Abraham did, as Hebrews 11 teaches us, the city, the kingdom that we are looking for is not anything here on this earth. The kingdom that we're looking for has the one man discovered just before his death is a kingdom that is coming and a reign that we're going to be a part of. Our hope is not in the things of this world. Our hope is not in what we personally do. But it's only in Him. And the righteousness that we have is imputed to us only from Him. When we come to the conference in June, Lord willing, I'll be able to go and uh, teach there.